ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدى هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار this is the sister's class that we hold on Sundays here at Masjid Nurullah after Salat al-Dhuhr and of course the brothers are welcome to stay and benefit by the permission of Allah we wanted to give an advice to the sisters regarding these 10 days of Dhul-Hijjah in that it is upon our sisters to strive hard seeking the pleasure of Allah during these 10 days of Dhul Hijjah as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentioned an nisa shaqaiq ar rijal that the women are the twin halves of men and what that means is whatever goes for the men in Islam it's applicable to the woman except in the case when there is a proof or a text that shows that the matter is specifically for the men excluding the woman or the matter is specifically for the woman excluding the men other than that what goes for the men goes for the woman because they are the twin halves of the men and today this is the first day of Dhul Hijjah and walhamdulillah Dhul Hijjah is a sacred month from the four sacred months and we just exited from Dhul Qa'da which is also a sacred month and then we have after Dhul Hijjah Muharram which is a sacred month so you have three sacred months back to back Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah and Muharram and then you have Rajab by itself these days are the best days of the year as has come in the narration where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he mentioned establishing that these days are the best days of the year ما من أيام العمل الصالح فيها أحب إلى الله من هذه الأيام. There are no days in which the righteous action is more beloved to Allah than these days. And what the Prophet intended by here 
or what the Prophet intended here by the statement these days meaning the ten days or the first ten days of Dhul Hijjah another wording the Prophet mentioned Mal Amal Fi Ayyam Al Ashr that's specific because it's mentioning the actual ten Mal Amal Fi Ayyam Al Ashr Afdal Min Al Amal Fi Hadihi The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned There is no action that is performed during these 10 days That is better than an action that's done in other than the 10 days So the actions of righteousness that are done during the, ten, the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, nothing is equivalent to those actions. The Sahaba, when they heard this, they said, Ya Rasulullah, walal jihad fi sabilillah, O Messenger of Allah, not even jihad in the path of Allah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stated, وَلَا jihad fi سَبِيلِ Not even jihad fi سَبِيلِ is It's better than the good deeds that a person performs in the first ten days of Dhul Hijjah. إِلَّا رَجْلٌ Except for a person, خَرَجَ بِنَفْسِهِ وَمَالِهِ Except for the person who goes out with his life and his wealth. ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْجِعْ Minhu bi shayin, and then he doesn't come back with anything, meaning he dies in battle. That's better. But if if it's not that, then there's nothing better from the good deeds. These days, barakallah fikum jamian, are days of magnifying Allah. Praising Allah, establishing that none has the right to be worshipped except for Allah. As we find the Sahaba radiallahu anhuma from them, Abdullah bin Umar and Abu Huraira radiallahu anhuma, كان يخرجان إلى السوق في أيام العشر. فَيُكَبِّرَانَ وَيُكَبِّرُ النَّاسِ بِتَكْبِيرِهِمَا That Abdullah bin Umar and Abu Huraira رضي الله عنهما they used to go out to the marketplace during the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah the first 10 days and they will be saying Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar La ilaha illallah Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar wa lillahi alhamd They will be saying this Magnifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And when the people would hear this They would repeat after them Meaning from hearing their takbir They will begin to say Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar La ilaha illallah Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Wa lillahi alhamd So these ten days Are the days of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more you praise Allah during these days, the greater the reward you get. And this can be said at any time. The takbir, the tahleel, and the tahmeed. Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, and alhamdulillah. These words of remembrance can be said at any time. Before the salah, after the salah, while you're walking, while you're laying down in the masjid, outside of the masjid. So it was upon the sisters to busy themselves by keeping their tongues moist with the remembrance of Allah. Don't waste the time with gossip and backbiting and speech that has no benefit, vain talk. Don't waste your time with these things because these things divert you and take you away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just as it is upon the men to strive to get closer to Allah during these days, it is upon you, 
O oh, sisters, to strive to get closer to Allah during these days. There is a narration that comes in the, <coughs> the Musnad of Imam Ahmad and Sheikh bin Baz, rahimahullah, he said that the chain of narration is a good chain. An ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, an al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal, ما من أيام أعظم عند الله ولا أحب إليه من العمل فيهن من هذه الأيام العشر فأكثر فيهن من التهليل والتكبير والتحميد. عبد الله بن عمر رضي الله عنهما he mentioned that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said there are no days greater or more magnificent with Allah. Nor any days more beloved to Allah, wherein the righteous actions, or uh, not me, start from the beginning. There are no days more magnificent with Allah, nor any days that are more beloved to Allah, in which the actions are done, than these ten days. Therefore, say, La ilaha illallah in abundance. And say Allahu Akbar in abundance And say Alhamdulillah in abundance And this narration Is in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad And other than him And as mentioned the narration Tahleel la ilaha illallah Allahu Akbar And tahmeed Alhamdulillah So the Prophet said فَأَكْثِرُوا فِيهِنَّ مِنَ التَّهْلِيلِ what takbir, what tahmeed. Say this, say these words in abundance. Again, a tahleel is la ilaha illallah. A takbir is Allahu Akbar. And a tahmeed is alhamdulillah. And if on the word, uh, halala, or kabbara, or hamada. And if the person is saying la ilaha illallah, kabbara, the person is saying Allahu Akbar. And Hamada, the person is saying, Alhamdulillah. So this is what is encouraged during these days. That a person keeps his tongue moist with these words of remembrance. When we say, La ilaha illallah, this is establishing that none has the right to be worshipped except for Allah. This is what we were created for. When we say, Allahu Akbar, we are establishing that nothing is greater than Allah. And that Allah is the greatest. And when we say Alhamdulillah, we are establishing that all of the praise is for Allah alone. For Allah Azza wa Jal, He is Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of the creation. So the hamd is for Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these days are days in which we should take advantage. Likewise during the night, except that the last ten nights of Ramadan are better than the ten nights the first ten nights of Dhul Hijjah. However, it's still a virtuous time and the people should strive. Allah Azza He mentions, فَاسْتَبِقُوا الْخَيْرَاتِ Hasten in doing that which is good. Be forward and foremost in doing that which is good. And this is a commandment from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that we should strive to be in the forefront of doing that which is good. No one should like to be from the last of the people to do that which is good or to embark upon that which is good. For Allah Azza wa Jal, He praises the people who are foremost in doing good. Allah Azza wa Jal commands with this affair of being in the forefront of doing good. Allah Azza wa Jal, He states, سَابِقُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ أَرْضُهَا كَعَرْضِ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ أُعِدَّتْ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرُسُلِهِ ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ ذُو الْفَضْلِ الْعَظِيمِ Allah says, be in the forefront Hasten in seeking the forgiveness of your Lord. Also hasten and be in the forefront of seeking a paradise who is with 
is like the width of the heavens and the earth, which has been prepared for those who believe in Allah and believe in His messengers. And that is the virtue of Allah that He gives to whomsoever He wills, and Allah is the possessor of magnificent virtue and bounty. So the Allah He mentions here, Sabiqu, be in the forefront, be the first of the people who is seeking forgiveness of Allah. These ten days, this is something that we also should be striving to do. Making a lot of istighfar. Asking Allah to forgive us during these days. And seeking the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal is done at all times, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he used to do. But seeking forgiveness of Allah during these ten days is the best time for a person to seek forgiveness of Allah. And this is the most beloved time for a person to seek the forgiveness of Allah. Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, we should be striving to seek the paradise. And Allah describes the paradise that the width of the paradise is similar to the width of the heavens and the earth. And that's vast. And who has the paradise been prepared for? Lilladina amanu billahi wa rusulihi. For those who believe in Allah and His messengers. Iman, barakallahu fikum is a tremendous affair, is a favor from Allah. For being a believer, as they say, membership has its privileges. When you are a believer, when you're within the fold of Islam, you are a member of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's benefits, there are privileges that you get, that those who are not members, they don't get. And from the greatest of the privileges and the bounties from Allah, is that Allah puts you in a paradise in the hereafter. That's not for everybody. Everybody can't go into paradise. Everybody will not be able to see Allah in the day of judgment. That's only for the believers. From the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the previous believers from the previous nations. As for the disbelievers, due to their abstinence and their arrogance and turning away from Allah, turning away from His messengers, they will be deprived of this. They will not receive this reward. So know that in you being a believer, this is something that's tremendous and magnificent. This is not a light thing. Being a Muslim is the greatest honor that one can have. Being a Muslim is the most beloved of the characteristics to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah, He gives this virtue to whomsoever He wills. Not everybody gets this virtue. But they are the people that Allah has chosen to receive this bounty. Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentions, وَالسَّارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ أَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِكُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالدَّرَّاءِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْرِ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentions hasten to the forgiveness from your Lord and a paradise whose width is the heavens and the earth which has been prepared for the muttaqeen. In the other verse, it has been prepared for those who believe. Now in this verse, it has been prepared for the people of taqwa. Taqwa is something that is very important in the life of the Muslim, especially during these 10 days. Because your taqwa during these 10 days is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than your taqwa outside of these 10 days. Then Allah azza wa jal mentions some characteristics of the people of taqwa. Those who spend in times of ease and in times of difficulty. A person, he spends from his wealth. He spends from his time. He spends from that which Allah has given him. In times of ease, in times of happiness, he spends, he gives. And likewise, in times of difficulty and hardship, he still gives from his time. He gives from his wealth. He gives from his strength to help the Muslims. This is from the taqwa of Allah. وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْرِ And those who restrain and control their anger. And this is very important, especially during these 10 days, that we are people who 
control our anger and that we try and strive to only do that which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having uncontrolled anger this can lead a person to doing something that Allah is not pleased with and this is why the Prophet he said to the man when he said Ya Rasulullah Awsi O Messenger of Allah advise me he said La Tawbah don't become angry and the Prophet repeated this advice La Tawbah La Tawbah do not become angry do not become angry because when a person becomes angry it can lead a person to losing control of himself and now the shaitan he comes in and it's the individual is like a puppet now the shaitan pulling the strings and moving him how he wishes because the person is enraged so it's very important control your anger because anger will make you do something or make you say something that later on you regret also from the characteristics of taqwa وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ those who pardon the people these first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah is the best time to pardon people. Someone has done wrong to you, pardon them. Pardon them. Except if pardoning them is going to lead them to do more wrong. But some people you can't pardon them. Because if you pardon them, they're not going to learn their lesson. They're going to continue to do evil. They're going to, take, they're going to continue to do corruption. But those individuals, if you pardon them, is going to lead them to becoming better. And they will be appreciative of you pardoning them. Pardon them. Wallah, don't, don't keep holding them to, to the affair. Let them go. Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentions, Wallahu yuhibbu al-muhsineen. And Allah, He loves those who do good. So all of these actions that have been mentioned, this is from al-ihsan. From doing good. And then Allah goes on to mention وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُوا الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَمْ يُسِرُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ أُولَئِكَ جَزَاؤُهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَجَنَّاتٌ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَنِعْمَ أَجْرُ الْعَامِنِينَ SubhanAllah. And those when they do an act of indecency, or they wrong themselves, they remember Allah, and as a, uh, as a result of them remembering Allah, they seek Allah's forgiveness for their sins. And who is the one who can forgive sins except for Allah? And they do not continue upon doing which they did, while they know better. Allah goes on to say, those individuals, their reward is a forgiveness from their Lord in gardens underneath which rivers flow to abide therein and a beautiful, blessed reward for those who do good. Indecency is something that is commanded by the shaitan. Al-Fahisha. Al-Shaitan huwa ladhi ya'mur bil fawahish. Shaitan is the one who commands people to do indecency. Whether it is indecency from speech or indecency in actions. As for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he never commanded anyone with indecency. For he commands the people with that which Allah commands with. Allah does not command with fahsha ever. And this is one of the ways you can tell when something is from the religion and something is not from the religion. If that matter entails indecency, wallahi, it's not from the religion. Because Allah, he, he does not command with, 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 with uh, fawahish. He does not command with indecency. He does not command with evil. As for shaitan, then he's the one who has commanded you to be indecent in your speech, indecent in your action, indecent uh, in your behavior. And likewise, those who wrong themselves. A person wrongs themselves by disobeying Allah. Every time a person disobeys Allah, he's wronging himself. Every time. Every sin is considered zulm nafs oppression to the self. How is it? Because when you disobey Allah, you put yourself in a position to be punished. Not it doesn't mean necessarily Allah will punish you. 
Because Allah He is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Allah is forgiving. I mean, Allah is most merciful, the bestower of mercy. Allah is Al-Ghafur. Allah He is the all-forgiving. Allah is very, and Allah is As-Sabur. Allah is patient with the people. But still, with the committing of the sin, you put yourself in a position to be punished. Because we don't know when Allah is no longer going to be patient with us. We don't know when that time will come. We don't know what sin that Allah is not going to forgive us for and pardon us for and overlook and Allah is going to call us to account for in this life. We don't know. So putting yourself in that type of position is you're wronging yourself. You're doing wrong to yourself. You're harming yourself. So any sin that a person commits, it is considered ظلم nafs. But Allah describes the people, أَوْ ظَالْمُ أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكُرُ اللَّهَ or they wrong themselves, and then after they do the wrong, they remember Allah. They remember Allah. And when they remember Allah, فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ So due to them remembering Allah, they seek forgiveness for their sins. And this shows the importance of dhikrullah azawajal. That the dhikr of Allah leads the person to istighfar. When you remember Allah much, and this is why the Prophet wasallam he used to make istighfar in a sitting over 70 times or over 100 times a day as a come in the narration. Because he was one who constantly was mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So constantly he said, Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. Astaghfirullah wa atubu In abundance. So when a person does wrong, let them remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let that remembrance be the means to guide them to seeking the forgiveness of Allah. Then what Allah mentions, وَمَنْ يَكْفِرُ الظُّنُوبِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And who is the one who forgives the sins except for Allah? Alhamdulillah, this is a rahmah from Allah Azza wa Jal. That we have a direct relationship with Allah. We don't have to go to the imam and go sit in the office. Or say, imam, I have sinned. And then you're exposing your sins to the Imam. Like in the Catholics, they go to the confession booth, Father, I have sinned. What have you done? I did this, I did that, I stole this, I did that, I killed this person, did that, I was committing <coughs> sin, and blah, 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 blah. And then the, the priest says, well, go say about 20 Hail Marys, 15 Our Fathers, <coughs> right? And on the way, I'll put something in the box. <laughs> yeah, no. Alhamdulillah for Islam. A person can repent to Allah directly. He doesn't have a media, uh, uh, a person, uh, a wasifa, a mediator between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah, when He says this, وَمَنْ يَكْفِرُ الذُّنُوبِ إِلَى Allah shows that Allah is forgiving. So that a person doesn't fall into despair. As Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentions, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَصْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جِمِعًا Say, O oh my slaves, O oh my servants who have wronged themselves, don't despair from the mercy of Allah. Indeed, Allah forgives all sins. No matter how great the sin may be, Allah will forgive you if you turn to Him in repentance. But what does the shaitan do? When you commit a sin, especially if it's a big sin, a major sin, the shaitan tells you, Allah is not going to forgive you. you come, you've gone too far now. Your minds will go all the way. You really did it. This is the second time you did this, brother. You're not sincere in your tawbah. Your minds are just, if you're going to do it, be 100%. Don't play around with the religion of Allah. SubhanAllah. The person says, yeah, I, I'm not ready to be righteous, so I'm just going to... Instead of just making tawbah, he lose hope. So Allah, he mentions, وَلَا تُلْكُ بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى تَحْلُكَ Don't let your hands be the cause of your destructions. Some of the ulama of tafsir, they mention that what happens is when a person commits a sin, the shaitan comes to the person and tells the person Allah is not going to forgive them. So he continues to do the sin. He doesn't make tawbah. So now he causes his own destruction.
But a part of seeking Allah's forgiveness is that you leave the sin off. Don't continue to do the evil. As Allah mentions, وَلَمْ يُسِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ And they do not continue upon doing that which they did of evil while they know better. Meaning they know what's wrong. And this is very important, especially during these 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, that the things that we are doing, that we know we have no business doing, Wallahi, now is the time to make tawbah. Now is the time to repent. This is the best time to make tawbah. During these first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. Those are the ones, meaning those who have these characteristics, they are the ones whom their reward is forgiveness from their Lord. And gardens underneath which rivers flow to abide therein. Once you go to Jannah, you never leave. Different from when you get one of the luxury three bedroom apartments here in Left Rock City. <laughs> so they say, this is luxury apartments. <laughs> They call it, I'll just say what they say. It's right there, right? The luxury apartments, huh? Allah was the eye. But here's the thing, a person who comes here to left rack, gets one of the, the quote-unquote luxury apartments. But then, he loses his job, he can't keep up with the rent. What happens? Yes, sir. You gotta go. The letters start coming in the mail from the lawyers and processes being put in place to get eviction. That's in the dunya. Once you enter the paradise, no eviction. Alhamdulillah. Once you're in, you're in forever. And this is the difference between paradise at the time of Adam, there was that possibility of being put out and then entering into paradise in the next life. Once you enter, Alhamdulillah, there's no way possible for you to be expelled. The first living in paradise, there was a test in there. Where Allah told Adam alayhi salam and Hawa not to eat from the tree. That test was there. But when the people go into paradise in the akhirah, there are no tests. No tests. And you abide therein forever. And even the Muslims who go to the hellfire, or who Allah has decreed for them to go to the hellfire to be punished for their sins, they're going to come out eventually. And then they're going to be in paradise and then they'll be in there forever. And this is a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That a, a reward that never ends, a pleasure or a delight that never ends. Here in this dunya we have good times. But then it has to come to an end. The day of Eid is a joyous occasion. The Muslims we are happy, we're having a good time, we're enjoying each other's company. But tomorrow is work. You go to make Hajj, Alhamdulillah. You're in Mecca, you're making the Hajj. You're so happy to be there. You're seeing the Kaaba after the Hajj. You may have some more days there. You're praying in the Haram. But you have the return ticket. That delight comes to an end. You're in Medina, MashaAllah. You prayed in the Prophet's Masjid. You visited the Prophet's grave. You visited the Sahabas. You made dua for them. Prayed in Masjid Al-Quba, MashaAllah, happy. Drinking Zamzam water, the return ticket, gotta go back. That's the dunya for you. The times when you're happy and then the, 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 the light comes to an end and then there's going to be sad times also. But in Jannah, it's all happiness. There's no sadness in Jannah. And that's something that should be an encouragement for us to put forth a lot of good, especially during these first 10 days of the Hijjah. Also from the actions that we should busy ourselves with is the recitation of the Qur'an. We should recite the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in abundance during these days. For the Book of Allah is the guidance for every Muslim. As Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, Uhuda lil muttaqeen. 
guidance for those who have taqwa. Also, barakallahu feekum, from the good that we should do, is the fasting. In this matter, barakallahu feekum, has come up regarding the narrations that have come. We have one narration that has come on some of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يصوم تسع ذي الحج ويوم عاشورة وثلاثة أيام من كل شهر. They stated that the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم used to fast nine days of the Hajj. And the day of Ashura and three days from every month. That's one narration. That is one narration. What is Ashura? Ashura is the tenth day of Muharram. Next, the uh, next month, and that's the day where Allah Azza wa Jal He saved Musa and Bani Israel from Fir'aun. So when the Prophet reached Medina and found that the people were fasting, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked them, why are you fasting on this day? And they said, this is the, in the, he asked the Jews this, the Prophet found the Jews fasting. Why are you fasting on this day? So they said, this is the day and then Allah Azza wa Jal saved Bani Israel from Fir'aun. Saved Musa and Bani Israel from Fir'aun. The Prophet said, نَحْنُ أَحَقْ Musa مِنْكُمْ We have more rights to Musa than you. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi ordered with fasting on the day of Ashura. And this was the first obligatory fast. And then afterwards, that became abrogated. And then fasting in Ramadan was obligated. So we have that narration on the wives or some of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is another narration on the authority of Aisha radiallahu anha she said ma ra'ait rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sa'iman fil ashr qat she said i never seen the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fasting during the 10 days ever or oh, i never seen this So now it appears to be a contradiction. Some wives saying that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fasted the nine days from the ten. And the reason why it's nine because it's prohibited to fast on the day of Eid. It's not allowed for a person to fast on Eid al-Fitrah or Eid al-Adha. Those days fasting is prohibited. So it's mentioned the nine here. Meaning nine out of the ten. But Aisha says she stated she never seen the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam fasting the ten. And what is intended by the ten meaning the nine, because of course the tenth day we cannot fast for sure. So some say this this is con- is a conflict here between the two narrations. And here's the principle: whenever we find two narrations or texts seemingly contradicting one another. The first thing that should be done is seek to bring harmony between the texts. Because both the text is revelation from Allah and there is no contradiction between the revelation. 
As Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنِّي غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجِدُوا فِي اخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرًا Do they not ponder and reflect over the Qur'an? And if the Qur'an had been from other than Allah, then they would have found many discrepancies, many contradictions therein. So there is no contradiction in the revelation of Allah. So whenever the text seemingly, and I say seemingly because that's what it is, it appears to be a contradiction. But the reality is that there is no contradiction. So the first thing that should be done is we seek to bring harmony between the texts. If harmony or al-jam' bayn al if one cannot combine between the texts, then the next thing that is looked into is abrogation. Maybe one text abrogates the other. But how is that established? The scholars of usul, they mention that when you cannot bring harmony between the texts, and one t- and it is and you can establish that one text came after the other, far as time wise, then you can establish that the matter is abrogation. One text is the nasikh and the other text is the mansur. So the latter text will be the nasikh and the earlier text will be the mansur. As an example, well yeah, you see though that was the prohibition coming in stages. In the beginning of the affair in Islam, when a person died and he owed money, the Prophet wouldn't pray over him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then later on, when the wealth started to come to the Muslims, when someone died and he had debt, the Prophet would say, does this person owe any wealth? It would be say, yes, the Prophet would say, I'm responsible for the debt. And then he would pray. So in the beginning, the Prophet himself wouldn't pray, but he would say, Sallu ala sahibikum. He would tell the companions, pray over your, oh, pray over your companion. For what purpose? To show the severity of dying and owing people money. But then later on, the Prophet stopped that practice. And when the wealth was Coming in in abundance, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began to take the responsibility for those who owe wealth. So that practice is no longer the first practice. That's abrogated. That's no longer applicable. The second practice is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ended the affair on. So that's what we do now. We question, does the person owe any wealth? And if there's someone who will take responsibility? I'll take responsibility and then we go ahead and pray over the person. But there are many examples that that can be given. But now, what if you cannot establish a timeline? And you cannot bring harmony between the texts. This is when the scholars, they go to that which is known as a tarjih Declaring one text to be stronger than the other. And the stronger text, that's what's followed. So now going back to these two narrations, Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, I never seen the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fasting during the first ten. The scholars, they responded to this. They say that it is possible that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he left off fasting during the first ten days due to a sickness, or he was traveling, or other than that. Another answer they give is that Aisha radiallahu anha was not aware of him fasting the first ten days, meaning the nine. And it is possible because Aisha is only speaking about what she didn't see and what she didn't know. And there is a principle in the religion, al muthbit yuqaddam ala nafi. The one who affirms something 
takes precedence over the one who negates. So there are wives who say that he was fasting. Aisha said he didn't fast. All of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they have integrity and they are truthful women. So and Aisha saying that she did not see the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam fasting. Yes, she did not see him fasting. And as for the wives who stated that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did fast, then they are the ones who know. So the one who knows is taken over the one who don't know. And that's a principle from the religion. The one who knows is taken over the one who doesn't know. And this is not a contradiction. Aisha is speaking according to her knowledge, radiallahu anha, and the other wives, they spoke according to their knowledge. <clears throat> Another thing or matter that is mentioned by some of the ulama of fiqh, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had nine wives, and he split up the time between them. So it is possible that during the days he was fasting, he was not with Aisha radiallahu anha. Her day didn't come while he was fasting. Another point that's mentioned is that that which Aisha radiallahu anha is referring to is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he left off that fast, or he did not do that fast, out of fear that it will become obligatory upon the ummah. Just like when he left off praying at night during Ramadan in congregation, out of fear that it will become obligatory upon the ummah, he said likewise, he left off that fast out of fear that it will become obligatory upon the ummah. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he yuhib al-takhfif. He loves to make things easy for the ummah. They say it's possible. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam left off fasting the ten days in order to preserve his strength in doing other actions that are greater than fasting, or what is intended by Aisha radiallahu anha that he never fasted the entire ten days. So when she said, "I never seen him fast." The t at the ten, meaning in total. Eight. Is that again? Eight. That's that's one of the, under the explanations that's given. Seven. Right, that she didn't see him ever fast the entire ten. But in any event, fasting is from those actions that are recommended and encouraged during these ten days. There is a narration that Abu Huraira radiallahu an he had asked a man or a man asked him excuse me he says inna alayya ayyamin min ramadan there are some days that i owe from ramadan afa asum al ashra tatawwan قال لا ولما ابدا بحق الله ثم تتوع بعد ما شد This narration is in the Musannif of Abdul Razak that Abu Huraira was asked by a man indeed there are some days I owe from Ramadan should I fast the ten, first ten days of Dhul Hijjah as a recommended act? Abu Huraira said no. And why? He said begin with the right of Allah first and then do the supererogatory acts after that as you wish. So Abu Huraira told the man not to fast the ten days 
but fast the days he owed from Ramadan first, because this is that which is obligatory upon him. As for fasting the days, the ten, first ten days of Dhul Hijjah, this is recommended. So you see the angle? Hey, well, Abu Huraira, he did not criticize the man for wanting to fast the ten days of Dhul Hijjah. Rather, he established that yes, you can do this, but it is befitting that you fast the days that you owe for Ramadan first. And this is an indication that fasting the ten days of Dhul Hijjah was something that was known by the Sahaba. As some of the ulama, they extract from this narration. Naam. Also, there is a narration that is authentic on Ibn Aun rahimahullah that he said, Kana Muhammad yusum al-ashra ashra dhil hijjah kulli that Muhammad he used to fast the ten, the ten from dhul hijjah, all of it. And of course, meaning the nine. So in any event, the narration that we began with, مَا مِنْ أَيَامْ الْعَمَلُ الصَّالِفِ فِيهِنَّ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْأَيَامْ That there are no days in which the righteous action is more beloved to Allah than these days. The righteous action includes siyam, it includes fasting. Another matter that we encourage the sisters with, and this is in relation to the fasting, that if you're going to fast and you are married, then make sure that you get the permission of your husband to fast before you fast. Why is that? Because when it comes to the option of fast, it is not permissible for the woman to fast except with the permission of her husband. Because perhaps the husband may want to enjoy her company and if she's fasting, then he's not able to enjoy her in the lawful manner. So if the sisters are going to fast these days, then let them seek the permission of their husbands. And let the husbands uh, allow them to fast if there's no need for them, uh, as a means of encouraging them to do that which is good. But if you owe days from Ramadan, then make up your days from Ramadan. And this is the best time to make up your days from Ramadan because action during these days, during these days are more beloved to Allah than the other days. So making up an obligation or giving Allah His right, this is from the good deeds. So if you owe days from Ramadan, then make up the days that you owe from Ramadan. Another matter, barakallah fikum, jami'an. And specifically for the sisters. Increase in your teaching of the children during these days. Because this is something normally that the women have taken the responsibility of doing. And that is educating the Muslim children. And for this reason, the scholars have described the Muslim woman as being the backbone of the society, the backbone of the ummah. Because it is the woman who raised the future before they start going with the men and specifically the boys. But the women, they are the first teachers of the children. So use this time to increase in your education of the children. And know that that which you teach your children it will go on your scales of good on the day of judgment. And this is implementing the statement of Allah, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, ku an fusakum wa ahlikum nara. All you who believe, save yourselves and your family from a fire. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said, that the meaning of this statement of Allah, save yourselves and your family from a fire, alimuhum wa adibuhum. Teach them and discipline them. 
So it's encouraged for you, my noble sisters, increase in your teaching of the children during these days. And for you is a great reward. For teaching the children during these days is greater and better than teaching the children in any other days. Another matter, inshallah ta'ala, we will end with this. If there is any sister who is going to slaughter, then it is not for her to take from her hair, nor her fingernails or toenails, nor any hair off, off of her body. Again, as the Prophet mentioned, an nisa shaka'iq al-rijal. You have some of the sisters, they are not married, but they have the wealth to slaughter and they desire to slaughter. Meaning that someone will slaughter on their behalf. Or even some women, mashallah, they take it upon themselves to slaughter their own animal. In any event, if there is a sister that's going to slaughter, then the same rules apply to her that apply to the man. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi وسلم يمنشن إذا دخل شهر ذي الحجة وأراد أحدكم أن يضحي فلا يأخذ من شعره ولا من أظفاره شيئا The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم mentioned that when the month of Dhul Hijjah enters and one of you wants to slaughter let him not take anything from his hair nor from his nails let him not take anything from his hair, nor from his nose. So whether you're going to slaughter, or whether you're designating someone to slaughter on your behalf, meaning you're the one who is paying the money, but someone is going to carry out the act of slaughtering on your behalf, then it is upon you to refrain from cutting your hair, cutting your nails, or taking the hair off of your body. As for the one who is being designated, then the rule doesn't apply to him. No. And this is from the greatest of the actions that we do. And you have to refrain from taking from your hair or your nails or anything from your body. As sometimes some women they use like the hair remover, like this is not allowed during this time if you have the intention to slaughter. The hair removal from the hair on the legs or the likes. The, uh, it's not allowed for the woman to do this if they intend to slaughter. If their husband is the one who's going to slaughter, then that which is uh, correct is not upon them. Some ulama, they say it's upon the whole family to refrain. No. Because that's the sacrifice, the sacrificial animal is for the family. So it's upon the whole family to refrain. And other scholars say no, that which is correct is for the one who is going to do the slaughtering to refrain and not upon the family. And inshallah this is uh, what is the most correct opinion by Ithnillahi ta'ala. But once you do the slaughtering, and the slaughtering, it has to be done after Salat or Eid. Either on the day of Eid or the following three days, which are known as Ayamu Tashriq. The 11th, the 12th, or the 13th. So you have from after Salat or Eid up until Maghrib on the 13th day of Dhul Hijjah. Once Maghrib comes in, the time of slaughtering has ended. So you have the day of Eid after Salat or Eid and then the next day, then the day after that, and then the day after that to slaughter. And those days are days of fasting, up, excuse me, days of eating and drinking. As we cannot fast on the day of Eid, and as for those days of Tashriq, it's dislike for a person to fast on those three days because this is the days of celebration, days of eating and drinking, as the Prophet mentioned, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll stop at this point, whatever is correct. The praises for Allah, whatever is incorrect is for myself. For subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Shalom Allah, ilaha ila anta, stagfiru kuwantu bilink.